Washington Journal continues. On this Sunday, October the 25th, a look at some of the morning headlines. The front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer, This Week in Space, Breaking Barriers of Age and Physics. John Glenn, 77, will go where no man his age has gone before. Also this morning, below the fold, the Baltimore Sun, Glenn eagerly accepts role as Shuttle's top guinea pig. The New York Times for John Glenn and the nation, a trip in time, back in time and space. And finally this morning from the Washington Post with Glenn, routine mission soars. We're joined by Lori Garver from NASA. Thanks very much for joining us. Good morning. John Glenn aside, what is this mission all about? Uh, this mission is a unique uh, explanation of what the shuttle is all about. We are doing cutting-edge science in astronomy, uh, medical science, uh, physics. It is a combined uh, commercial and government uh, mission as well as international. We have uh, ESA and Japan having astronauts aboard and we're really just happy to be able to show off to the world the exciting science the Space Shuttle has been doing for the last 15 years. How many Challengers are currently in operation? How many Space Shuttles? Uh, there are four Space Shuttles. And this one will be? Discovery. The Philadelphia Inquirer says gerontologists and aging experts hope that John Glenn's mission will lay to rest the notion that age is a barrier to anything. How so? Well, we have not flown anyone in space uh, older than 60 years old, and John Glenn will be uh, a person uh, among the seven crew members who will be doing scientific experiments. His, he will be doing more experiments than anyone on the mission, however, since as a payload specialist, it is his primary uh, point of being there. He will be hooked up to uh, instruments which measure bone loss, uh, muscle deterioration, uh, he will be doing sleep experiments, uh, experiments really that affect those people in the aged population more than those of us who are younger. We have known for quite some time that as people spend larger amounts of time in space, it looks like what's actually happening to their bodies is they're aging. Uh, so it has been known for quite some time that it would be interesting to have an older subject in space. Also this morning, the New York Times pointing out that the Discovery crew will be looking at the Hubble Space Telescope and sending up new equipment. Yes, the shuttle payload bay will have a couple of sections. One dedicated to the life sciences experiments that, the, that Senator Glenn and the other crew members will participate in. The rest of the payload bay will hold both the astronomy um, payload, the Spartan payload, which will be looking at the corona of the sun, as well as some experiments that will be testing equipment for an upcoming uh, Hubble servicing mission. Lori Garver from NASA will be with us till the top of the hour. New York City is our first call for this segment. Good morning. Good morning. I have two questions I'd like your guest to please clarify. One has to do with, I believe it's called the Caprini Space Probe, that uh, Dr. Michio Kaku, among other people, fears has the potential because of the plutonium of um, killing a substantial uh, number of the population. And the second question is something I read in a book published in 86, that during the planning for the Apollo mission, NASA engineers, in order to, com in order to overcome conceptual engineering difficulties, took psychedelic drugs. Uh, could you please respond to those two things? Thank, Thank you, caller. Well, regarding the first, I believe you're referring to the Cassini uh, space probe, which is going to uh, Saturn. Yes, it does carry uh, uh, RTGs uh, that have some nuclear plutonium involved that is um, not a reactor, and we have flown this a number of times. The Galileo and Ulysses space missions uh, most recently also flew a very similar RTG, as we did during the lunar missions. Uh, we do go through all of the environmental research. Um, it is very well protected, and all the times that we have flown this particular substance, we have been cleared, but we will go through uh, environmental uh, protection uh, legal issues in order to make sure that that will be safe. Uh, the second question regarding the psychedelic drugs for the astronauts. I have never heard anything like that. I was not involved in NASA at the time, but I don't believe any of that uh, would be true. We have some video that we want to show for those of you uh, watching on television and, and certainly not listening on radio. The electronic noise knows and the uh, oyster toadfish. What are they? Well, these are two of the experiments that will be in the life sciences portion of the spacecraft that I was talking about. The, uh, the payloads are uh, part of what we do at NASA, the 
The oyster toadfish is a life sciences experiment. It will be checking on the equilibrium of the vestibular system. Uh, right now you're seeing the toadfish. Uh, they, will, they will be uh, inserting electrodes into the toadfish uh, like they will be the human subjects that will be on the spacecraft. Uh, in addition, there are, I believe, over 50 uh, commercial space science uh, activities, in including uh, those that the government and uh, non-federal government uh, payloads. Do you know what it cost to build the Discovery? The space shuttles were built um, back in the 1970s. Only one has been built uh, since the Challenger accident. Uh, they cost about $3 billion. And for this mission, which is how many days? This mission is nine days. Can you put a price tag on it, a ballpark figure of what it would cost? I think um, what we look at is a cost of launching each particular mission around $300 million. And is Sen Senator Glenn being paid for his uh, time down there in training and his uh, time in space? Senator Glenn is a volunteer on this flight. He's a payload specialist. Uh, the other astronauts receive uh, federal government salaries. Um, they don't get extra money for going in space, and all of their uh, experiments that they do on behalf of the taxpayer are, are done as volunteers. Alan, Texas, with Lori Garver. NASA, good morning. Yes, good morning. Uh, I remember the, uh, the first shot and uh, the one that you show little excerpts of in the uh, NASA uh, uh, auditorium. And uh, I remember how uh, the uh, Russians, who were at that time still communists, had put out vicious propaganda that this was done in Hollywood and it wasn't real. But it really was. And uh, I'm so happy that we've come such a long way. And as far as... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Glenn is concerned. I wish him lots of luck up there. And is there a uh, frequency number where I could listen in again? Thanks, caller. Well, thank you. Um, we'll all be watching Senator Glenn and the entire crew. I think um, you can. Uh, you used to be able to call a 900 number to listen in. I think if you have an amateur radio, uh, there are lots of people who do that and can listen in on the space shuttle missions. And because of the unique aspects of this one, I believe there will be lots of uh, public coverage of every aspect of the mission. In the Washington, D.C. area, there is a NASA channel. Uh, how how widespread is that? How many people can get the NASA channel? Well, NASA TV... Um, is all over the country. It's not just in Washington, D.C., and it is used um, during missions for the communications between Mission Control and the crew. And certain cable uh, co um, companies offer NASA TV, and the caller can check with their cable station to see if it is available. San Diego is next. Good morning. Yes, good morning, and thank you for C-SPAN. Um, I'm calling in regards to uh, the issue about um, Senator Glenn's uh, trip to space and his age. This, um, there was a woman, the first woman in space uh, was supposed to go up either in the late 60s or early 70s. And young astronaut Senator Glenn testified before Congress saying that women couldn't take it and that this woman wasn't supposed to go. And um, I was wondering if uh, your guest could, could comment on this issue, because I'd like to see this woman. I believe she's now 62. And, uh, you know, I, I believe she should have her chance in space. I think you're referring to Jerry Cobb. She was not, in fact, the first woman astronaut, the first uh, woman astronaut we had to go in space, of course, with Sally Ride. Um, Jerry Cobb participated with a number of other women, actually, in experiments in the 1960s that were done privately to see how women uh, would be able to take the experiments of space uh, similar to the Mercury 7 astronauts. Uh, there were hearings on Capitol Hill, and I believe that uh, Senator Glenn, who was not a senator at the time, did testify uh, as you stated. However, at that time in the 1960s, you realize we were only taking uh, military pilots, so none of these women qualified in the sense that they met the criteria that NASA had previously established. Um, at this time, we don't have plans to fly uh, additional aging uh, people, aged people, but we do have, um, hope to get the results of these 
experiments and determine if there will be a program in the future where we would do that. And as part of the uh, biomedical experiments, which we have some video show you as well, the Baltimore Sun this morning says astronauts lose muscle and bone mass in space, their sleep is fractured, their hearts shrink, their immune system weakens, and they wobble and faint when they try to stand up after landing. It's called space adaptation syndrome. Can you elaborate? Well, space adaptation syndrome does affect each astronaut differently. Um, because of the privacy laws, we don't always know which are affected in which ways, but we do have um, a correlation that we have made, and trying to affect the countermeasures is something that we feel will be very helpful on the ground. When we look at uh, Senator Glenn in particular, many of those um, indications that, that you read about do um, come up in people who are older and so we feel that by flying the senator we will be able to maybe find ways to affect in a, in a positive way some of those uh, activities. Colorado Springs, good morning. Yes, good morning. Uh, I'm a 57 year old airline pilot in Colorado Springs and I wonder if your C-SPAN viewers uh, know that Senator Glenn, while uh, taking this grandstanding trip, uh, does not and is on record as not supporting the right of airline pilots to fly beyond age 60. Well, of course, Senator Glenn is not piloting the space shuttle uh, this time as he was a pilot when he was 40 uh, during the Mercury program. As a passenger and a payload specialist uh, on the space shuttle, I think that um, he, his aging is really what we're looking at. His age is something that uh, is what we're allowing to have him fly for. And no, he would not be qualified to be the pilot or commander of the space shuttle. From the Washington Post, a comparison between the two missions, uh, the, the mission that took place on February 20th, 1962 with Senator John Glenn on Friendship 7, that Mercury mission, and this shuttle mission. The uh, length of the Mercury mission was almost five hours. The shuttle mission is eight hours or eight days, almost nine days. The distance flown 75,000 miles on Mercury and 3.6 million miles on the shuttle mission. The landing will take place southeast of Bermuda and uh, for the shuttle mission it uh, will take place at the Kennedy Space Center. That comparison this morning, page A10 of the Washington Post. We'll get a call from Pittsburgh. Good morning, you're on C-SPAN. Good morning. Um, Senator Glenn being a payload specialist, I was wondering, I heard that he had melatonin experiments they were going to conduct? Yes. And it's my understanding that those were um, disallowed? Yes, the sleep experiment um, that I referenced earlier had three aspects to it, and one of those aspects involved uh, two of the, the two payload specialists taking uh, melatonin. And we did find out that Senator Glenn did not meet one of the criteria for that aspect of the sleep experiment, so he will not be taking melatonin, but he will be participating in the rest of the sleep experiment. Who else is on board this mission? Well, we have a commander, uh, Kurt Brown, who will be flying his fifth mission. Uh, Steve uh, Lindsay is the pilot. Um, Stephen Robinson is a mission specialist. Uh, Scott Perzinski, mission, mission specialist. Uh, Pedro Duque is the Spaniard uh, flying from the European Space Agency as a mission specialist. And then we have the two payload specialists, John Glenn and Chiaki Mukai from Japan. How often does the uh, shuttle go up? What's the schedule? The space shuttle, we have four, as I said, orbiters, and they go approximately seven times a year is the average that we've been launching. And your reaction to the attention that this one is getting? Well, uh, as we have said, we could not have predicted the attention of this mission, and we were planning to do the mission uh, because we ha are not launching the space station as we had hoped on time, although we will be launching in a couple months. So this mission had been planned. We knew it would be an interesting mission. Uh, with the addition of Senator Glenn, I think we're thrilled to be able to share the cutting-edge science and research that NASA is doing with the entire world. Is there too much hype? Um, I think as long as the astronauts and the crew, and they said they have, have been able to focus on the mission, um, we're, we're fine. Uh, too much hype, look at Apollo 11, look at John Glenn's first flight. Um, the space program is really all about expanding the envelope, and it's very uniquely interesting. Uh, I think this will be uh, mostly positive. Roaches in space, explain this ne next uh, bit of video that we'll be showing our audience. This is not the first time we've flown 
insects in space or roaches in particular um, because of their uh, extremely quick uh, gestation period it is insects are some of the um, investigations that we like to carry out their reactions to the microgravity environment are, are studied by our scientists um, again to determine if there are potential countermeasures and ways we can uh, have the adaptation into microgravity. So they bring all of this back. How long does it take for NASA scientists to, to sift through the data and come up with some sort of conclusion? Well, it depends on the experiments. Uh, most of the subjects have been tested both previous to the mission, during the mission, and after. Um, detailed measurements are taken. Uh, typically, it will, it will immediately um, be taken off of the space shuttle for those measurements to be taken, but then it could take uh, several months, obviously, for completion of research and writing it up in the scientific journals. We're talking about Thursday's launch of uh, the Discovery mission, which gets underway Thursday afternoon, and we're welcoming on this Sunday our viewers watching overseas. If you have a question for Lori Garva from NASA, give us a call especially if you're uh, watching on the BBC Parliament channel, 202-737-6734 is our international line. Remember to use the international code. Yuma, Arizona is next. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank God for C-SPAN, seeing as how uh, most of the other channels are Clinton Defense Committee. The young lady... The young lady there said that Senator Glenn volunteered for this mission as a retired Marine and knowing that if without integrity you're nothing, he traded his integrity for Bill Clinton during the Fred Thompson hearings. I find that uh, what he's done is that reprehensible and this is the, D the DNC October surprise because he is a Democrat. Actually, I think he's a Demopublican. Lori That's Garver? That's the way I feel about it. Thanks. Thanks for the call. Well, I, I guess my response is um, I don't believe this, this is a political mission at, in the sense that uh, there is a political payback. We have been very clear that we're flying John Glenn for a number of reasons, including uh, that we have 40 years of uh, medical data on him, that we have, uh, he has studied uh, geriatrics and the process of aging, and the fact that he has been an astronaut and um, a national hero. So the combination is the reason we're flying him. Last week in a 60 Minutes interview, uh, Bill Bradley said that he was relentless in, uh, Ed Bradley said that he was relentless in his uh, determination to get on this mission. I think Dan Golden, the administrator of NASA, who ultimately made the decision uh, to fly John Glenn, would agree with that. Uh, when he first came to see him, uh, Dan Golden has said he, he was not uh, inclined to do this and set up a criteria uh, for the flight that he did not believe John Glenn uh, would be able to meet. When he came back a year later, he had gone through uh, the aging research and, and we had worked with the National Institutes of Aging and the National Institutes of Health. Um, and we looked for reasons not to fly him and finally um, did agree that it was a very worthwhile thing to do. Can you explain this picture? Uh, we'll come back to the video in just a moment, but the electrodes that are on John Glenn's face, uh, what kind of a test is this? This is for the sleep experiment. He will be wearing this headset during the two aspects of the sleep experiment that I uh, mentioned he will be continuing to do. It will uh, look at his breathing patterns and his brain waves, um, eye movements, temperature, etc. He truly is a guinea pig on this flight. And anyone who believes that he's doing this for the heroism can just look at that and realize uh, he'll be working. The next call is from London. Good morning. Hello, you're on the air. Oh, good, good morning. Um, my comment was about internet access to the um, this coming up mission. I thought the pictures from the NASA websites of the recent Mars live pictures and the Mars coverage was absolutely excellent. What plans does NASA have to actually put the, this next launch out on the internet? Uh all of this information will also be on that same website uh, at www.nasa.gov uh, where you saw the Pathfinder photos. We expect there will be a lot of interest in this as well. Thank you. Next call from Capistrano Beach. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, my questions are with regard to the cost, uh, the price ticket on this whole thing. Uh, I have really three questions. I'd like to know what that total price tag is. 
uh, what percentage of that cost is for medical purposes and what percentage of the total cost is paid in private dollars. Thank you, caller. As I mentioned earlier, the, the marginal cost of each shuttle mission is around $300 million. This mission, of course, was planned uh, and most of the science was planned well before uh, John Glenn was added as a payload specialist. So his aspect of the mission uh, would be um, on, the, on the order of a million rather than the $300 million for the entire mission, which covers all these areas of science. I think um, that the medical uh, experiments were also going to be done. The John Glenn portion uh, would be, I think, more in the tens of thousands. When we used to fly commercial payload specialists, I think we charged around $80,000 for the training. Uh, so these are not huge numbers when you look at the return uh, that we plan to get medically from the experiments. Will there ever be a time when civilians will go back up in space as we saw with the, uh, the teacher and, of course, the uh, 1986 explosion of the Challenger? I think NASA does not have any plans at this time to fly civilians in the future. However, we do believe that as commercial vehicles are developed, uh, there are several now in the planning stages that would have private citizens flying in space. There is also potential for the company, United Space Alliance, USA, to eventually uh, commercialize space shuttle operations uh, to the point where they would be flying uh, private citizens who would be paying for flights. Uh, we don't believe that is the role of the government. However, we believe we should be pushing the envelope going further, uh, taking humans back to the moon and ultimately to Mars. Do you have any desire to go on board a, uh, a mission? I personally would love to go in space. It's not why I became involved in NASA. Uh, however, I think it's hard to work as closely with it as we do with the program and, and not uh, be at least uh, interested in the possibility. I think I would have to get a government job, uh, get a non-government job where I can make enough money so that I could pay for my flight in the future. Lori Garver is a graduate of Colorado College and George Washington University. She is the acting associate administrator for the Office of Policy and Plans for NASA. Another 10 minutes of your phone calls. Gary, Indiana, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have a question. What about the Leonoid meteor storm and what effect is it going to have and if it does have a devastating effect, do you all have a contingency plan of um, just keeping certain satellites up? Or, and when you go up, are you going to take some satellites down? Could you speak on that? Thank you. Thank yes. you. The meteor shower has gotten a, a lot of publicity, I think, because of the recent loss of the communication satellite that had such an effect on Earth. It really does point out uh, how our space program has affected our every way of life. Um, and we are taking precautions to the extent that some of the spacecraft are being rotated, moved into space so that um, they do not have uh, as much of a chance of being hit by the meteor showers. We do believe that those cosmonauts that are in the Mir spacecraft right now will be going into the Soyuz crew escape uh, vehicle as a precaution in case uh, it was hit. But uh, we do not have any plans to bring anything back right now. Of course, the shuttle, one of the unique aspects of it, of it is that it has that possibility. If there's a satellite that uh, is broken, we can return it, fix it, and take it back. And we have done that before. What is the Spartan satellite? The Spartan satellite is an ast astronomy uh, satellite that will be released by the space shuttle's robotic arm into the vacuum of space. It will look at the sun's corona and do a couple of experiments in that. Of course, the sun um, is critical uh, not only to the communication satellites that we have in space and how that can affect um, our communications here on Earth, but to every aspect of uh, life on Earth. Uh, the satellite will only be out for a couple of days, I believe two, and will be retrieved by the robotic arm and brought back. This is its fifth flight. In one of the articles, I read that in uh, Perth, Australia, they will make sure that the lights are particularly bright. Uh, those were the lights that John Glenn saw in his mission in 1962. Will the crew on board Discovery be able to see Australia if it's a clear night uh, from their vantage point? Yes, I think we have uh, worked out the timing so that if the space shuttle does launch on Thursday at 2 o'clock as planned, uh, the orbit that will take them closest to Perth uh, will be something uh, that will allow them to see the lights uh, on the ground. It won't be, we have told uh, the senator, quite the same as it was on Mercury because he was right over Perth. Uh, but I think it's a real uh, nice display of exactly what the world is feeling about uh, the space program right now. If it were delayed, what would the reasons be? 
Uh, primarily weather. Uh, we have had uh, incredible success in the past few years at launching space shuttles on time. Those space shuttles that had to go to the Mir spacecraft in particular had a very tight five minute window and 90% of those were launched within that window. There are weather constraints on launches obviously and, and we won't launch if uh, all those constraints aren't met. Paducah, Kentucky is next. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, you had a call a few minutes ago that was inquiring about frequencies, how to listen to the uh, the shuttlecraft on shortwave radio, and I do that on a regular basis. And if I could, I'd like to give that caller and the others who are interested some of the frequencies and how you can do that. Uh, w A three N A N broadcast the uh, rebroadcast the uh, uh, the shuttle from uh, somewhere in New England, and the frequencies are three point eight six zero, seven point one eight five. 14.295, 21.395, and 28.650. And all you need is a uh, shortwave radio that you can purchase in any radio shack. And it has to have a single sideband capability. And uh, with a little luck, you can tune them in. I listen to them uh, nearly every mission. And for those who didn't jot it all down, is this information also available on your website at all? Absolutely. Continue with your calls. Good morning. Where are you phoning from? Uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Go ahead, please. You're on C-SPAN. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, a number of the callers have called in uh, earlier complaining that possibly John Glenn was selected for political reasons. I think a lot of that uh, could probably be dispelled if the lady from NASA um, would give a list of the other astronauts that flew during that time that uh, also competed for this mission, which would have been the only fair way to select them. Or was John Glenn the only one considered? Well, John Glenn's place on this mission was specifically to do the aging research, and we did not uh, have a process set up. Uh, it was, in particular, in a response to his request to fly on the space shuttle, and we responded to that request in a positive way because he met all the criteria that we set up in order to do the research. As we're looking at... that we do in the neutral buoyancy facility down at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. They are training uh, in case of an abort where they would have to uh, land in the water. And uh, then you also saw them eating in the facility where they'll be choosing their food. It's a uh, unique aspect of this mission that John Glenn wasn't used to. If you recall when he flew 36 years ago, uh, they weren't even sure you would be able to swallow in space. They weren't sure he would be able to see or thought the shape of his eyes might change. When you look at that, you see the tremendous gains we've made uh, that we are now doing this cutting edge research and have really uh, understood basic science of uh, adaptation to microgravity. Clarendon, Arkansas, good morning. Yeah, I would like to ask the lady there, uh I think you said it cost three million dollars to put a, put the ship up. Three hundred million. Three hundred million. Well, let me tell you something. How about all of us veterans down here in, in this place in these hospitals has to pay our own way to get in the hospital and they spend three hundred million dollars to go up to, uh, go up in the air. The NASA budget is uh, just under $14 billion. It's about $13.6 billion, uh, which is less than 1% of the federal budget. And uh, I believe that as a public system, we do evaluate the uh, importance of space exploration. It is uh, an investment in our future. We are studying medical aspects that will help um, millions of people on Earth. Some of the research being done in this mission could affect uh, cancer, AIDS, uh, diseases that affect literally millions of people here on Earth. We have learned so much from space uh, that we believe it is worth the less than the 1% of the federal budget. There are obviously other parts of the budget that are also very important. The shuttle goes off Thursday. What's the next mission planned by NASA? The next mission is uh, also extremely exciting. It will be the launch of the Unity node for the space station on December 3rd. The first element launch of the space station will be launched from Baikonur uh, in Kazakhstan in November. And then the shuttle will take up the, the node on December 3rd. Lori Garver, thank you very much for joining us from NASA. Thank you.
And of course, we'll have coverage of the mission as it uh, gets underway Thursday, scheduled for 2 o'clock Thursday afternoon. A couple of programming notes for you. Uh, we hope you'll join us tonight for Book Notes, which is seen each and every Sunday evening at 8 o'clock Eastern and Pacific Time. Our guest is Dorothy Herman, who's the author of Helen Keller, A Life. That's followed by Prime Minister's Questions, which is tonight at 9 o'clock East Coast Time. Parliament resumed last Wednesday, and uh, when they are in session each Sunday evening, we show you Question Time with William Haig, who is a conservative party leader, Prime Minister Tony Blair, and members of Parliament. And also tomorrow morning on C-SPAN's Washington Journal, Richard Burke will be with us. He is the national political correspondent for the New York Times. Tavis Smiley of Black Entertainment Television and syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. One last look at the marathon which uh, our guest Lori Garver participated in <laughs> last year. Uh, it is a 26-mile marathon. This is the 23rd year for the Marine Corps Marathon. And Lori Garver, what was it like? Well, last year, unfortunately, it rained the entire five hours that I ran it. Uh, it's a wonderful experience just to set a goal and accomplish it, but it is grueling. And I can see those people going by now. I wasn't going on by this point uh, last year. I was a little slower. This, this is the group that will be in the first half of the finishers. 18,000 people participating in the Marine Corps Marathon, and that's it as we leave you on this Sunday morning. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and have a good week ahead. Here's our program lineup. Coming up, another look at this morning's...